When the first COVID-19 vaccines became available, Canadians rushed to get them. Uptake for boosters has been a bit slower, and there is still a small number of people that are vaccine hesitant. Could new technologies and updates on what's available raise vaccination rates and keep the pandemic from resurging? Let's ask in Thorold, Ontario, Dr. Mustafa Hirji, Acting Medical Officer of Health for Niagara Region. In Hamilton, Ontario, Don Bowdish, immunologist and professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. Matthew Miller, professor of biochemistry and biomedical sciences at McMaster University. And in Ontario's capital city, Omar Khan, a professor of biomedical engineering and immunology at the University of Toronto. Hi, everybody. Hello. Look, looking forward to this discussion and to learn more about what's happening in the world of vaccines. Uh, Dr. Hirji, I want to start with you. Uh, the uptake of boosters has really slowed down. What percentages are we seeing across the province now? Yeah, so if you're taking all ages zero and up, we've got about half of the population uh, vaccinated with that third dose. Uh, if we're looking at the 18 plus age group, which is really the group where that uh, third dose is really recommended, it's only at around 60%, which obviously isn't as high as we would like. The other key thing about it is that it really varies by our ages. If you're looking at the 70 and up population, the population at most risk of having severe outcomes, being hospitalized, unfortunately, perhaps even passing away, it's actually quite good in that group. It's well over 90%. But it starts to progressively go downwards as you go through the ages. And when you get down to the 20 year olds, it's only maybe around 30% or a little bit above that right now. So there's particularly a lot of work for younger people to help them see the importance of them getting vaccinated, that even if it's not necessarily for them, it's hopefully to make sure that they're not spreading COVID-19 to some more vulnerable people around them. Uh, Dr. Hirji, when the vaccines first became available, everybody was kind of like, you know, get the first vaccine that you um, are, that is available to your age group. And I remember being online, trying to book my vaccine. It was kind of like people were booking tickets for like the concert in town, but it was really important for people to get vaccinated. Um, it seems like it's changed when we do talk about boosters. What's your explanation for the low uptake? Yeah, so, you know, it's hard to necessarily say with a lot of confidence because I haven't seen any good polling on this yet. And I'd really like to get the direct information from the people who aren't getting vaccinated. The people we see in our vaccine clinics are obviously the people choosing to be vaccinated. So we're not necessarily seeing from the other side. But there's a few thoughts I have here. You know, you've actually just uh, highlighted one where you've used the language of a booster dose. And I think that's actually probably not the right framing anymore. A booster dose implies that you've got your vaccine series, you're done, and then this is, you know, you know, increasing your protection a little bit. And I think that really speaks to people maybe who feel more vulnerable and feel that this is something optional that you do if you maybe think you need a bit more protection. And that's, I think, not the case anymore. With the Omicron variant, you really do need three doses to get reasonably good protection against COVID-19. And I think we should really be reframing that Fully vaccinated now means actually three doses, and that this is a three-dose vaccine series. And I think that framing might help really get people in the mindset that they haven't finished getting vaccinated, they're not fully vaccinated, as the language goes, with two doses, but they actually need to get the three doses. And Omar, just to build on what uh, Dr. Yeah. Hirji was just saying, um, we've had various variants since the, uh, the vaccines came out. Are the vaccines we are now using still effective against the new mutated variants? For the original vaccines, they did a great job at fighting off the virus that they were originally designed for. But with high case numbers, there was viral evolution because every replication event is an opportunity for a mutation. And the problem is that the antibodies that we were developing weren't as good at recognizing these mutated spike proteins, which is fine, that happens. But so the ability to recognize it went down a bit. So you do have good protection. You have long lasting protection. It's just now you're asking your antibodies to see and recognize something that looks a bit different. So in framing it like that, when we boost people, we can bring back up your antibody levels to a high enough level where even if they are slightly less effective, there's more of them. So you can kind of help compensate for that. And that's what we call recall. So we try to induce recall. And otherwise, if you have antibodies that just don't have a good shot at recognizing the new mutated versions, then it would, your immune system will likely try to restart that process and develop 
brand new antibodies for it instead of using the original ones that are potentially less effective. So this is part of the challenge. And having a booster is a great stopgap while we wait for more updated vaccines to kind of tide us over. And Matthew, I guess this is where the conversation could lead to uh, what's been done right now, this idea of redesigning uh, the vaccines that we already have. Uh, why might they be more effective if they were to be redesigned? Well, the situation we're in right now in many ways is analogous to the situation that we're used to annually with seasonal influenza. Uh, as my colleague um, just described, uh, over the course of the past two years since the pandemic started, the, the very high global case rates have allowed this virus to evolve and mutate in such a way that it's no longer recognized as well by the immune responses we generated uh, via vaccination. And so one way to improve the quality of that immune response is to update our current vaccines so that they're a closer match to the viruses that are actually causing uh, infections now. And Don, how would that work? Would we have to go from starting from scratch or do we like do we need to do full clinical trials as well? It's a great question. We've learned a lot about protective immune responses to this virus. And so some of that learning we've been able to implement to next generation vaccines. And in fact, my very uh, clever colleague, Matthew, has done some some of that work in redesigning an inhaled vaccine that triggers different parts of the immune system, the cellular response as opposed to the antibody response. So in many ways, we have a little bit more knowledge about features that are more resistant to the virus changing and mutating. And by harnessing immune responses to those conserved elements, we may get more or better cross-variant protection. As for whether we need full clinical trials, well, that really depends on whether we understand what, what we call the immune correlate of protection is. So if we could say your antibodies have to be here to be protected or you need so many T cells, then we could use that as a proxy measure instead of waiting for people to get naturally infected. Clinical trials take a lot longer if, if there's less infection circulating and we have to wait for people be, to be infected. So understanding these immune correlates protection gives us a stopgap that we can make some inferences about protection without waiting for a really long period of time for people to get naturally infected in the trials. Matthew, Don mentioned inhaled vaccines. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, but I wanted to uh, give the time to Omar. I saw, Omar, you wanted to uh, respond to something? Yeah, I think for a lot of these vaccine technologies, for example, the mRNA technologies, they're designed to be platforms where they can be easily updated. What this means is that most of the vaccine stays the same. The only thing that's being updated is the mRNA, so the sequence of the mRNA. But everything else on how the nanoparticle is made remains the same. And that can potentially speed up the rate at which we can get vaccines out to people. But this is something new and regulatory bodies have to come to terms with this and understand how do you safely regulate this new type of technology that can be so rapidly uptaken and rapidly updated. So this is part of the other side of it when we think about you know, the development of the actual vaccine and what it takes to say that this is pretty much the same thing, it's only slightly updated. So perhaps you don't have to do a full three-phase clinical trial Maybe we just need enough to show that there is safety and coupled with the right correlates of protection, then this can be approved. So that's an active thing that's happening now on the other side from the regulatory body, because no regulatory agency wants to approve something that can potentially hurt uh, the citizens of their country, right? So this is an important question that everyone has to figure out. How do we safely update these things quickly? And I guess the quickly, the quickly part is important because uh, we're probably waiting for, it gives more time for new variants to come up as well. Um, Matthew, uh, I want to come to you. Uh, Health Canada approved the Nuvaxavid vaccine back in mid-February. Mid what makes it different from the other vaccines on the market right now? Well, the Novavax vaccine uses I knew I technology. said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the names of these vaccines, it's like, I knew I said it wrong. I tried. But go ahead. Sorry, Matthew. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. Yeah, the, the Novavax vaccine um, uses uh, sort of more conventional vaccine technology um, than some of the vaccines that were first approved for COVID-19. Um, well, mRNA vaccines and viral vectored vaccines have been studied uh, for, for decades, 
Um, these were really the first examples of those types of vaccines that were rolled out at a global level. The Novavax vaccine, um, instead of asking our cells to make the spike protein of coronavirus, which our immune system then responds to, in the Novavax vaccine, the spike protein is is part of the vaccine and is delivered directly to our immune system. And this is um, similar to many other vaccines that, that we're used to and that have been on the market for a long time, including things like um, the vaccine against shingles. And as a result of that, I think there's some hope that vaccines like Novavax may be appealing to people uh, who are nervous about some of these um, perceived newer vaccine technologies and thereby increase vaccine uptake uh, for those individuals. When do you think health units will be administering the uh, Novavax vaccine? Um, my expectation is that they could start um, administering that vaccine uh, almost immediately. I don't know exactly um, what the procurement numbers are like right now at local health units, but um, uh, I, I see no reason uh, why there should be any delay for people who, who might want to receive that vaccine at this point. Dr. Hirji? Yeah, speaking from the perspective of the local public health unit, what we're actually waiting on right now is actually for the vaccines to arrive in Canada. The federal government, of course, does the procurement, sends the vaccines to the provinces and then down to us at the local level, and we're still waiting for the federal government to actually receive the vaccine. Our understanding is it's supposed to arrive by the end of the month. So, you know, my hope is within the next couple of weeks, we can hopefully start to administer it. And actually, just very quickly, um, uh, Nam, going back, you were correct. Novaxovid is the brand name of the vaccine. Novavax is the company that helped develop the vaccine. So when you say the Novavax vaccine, or what you said, Novavax, of it, it's usually just two different names for the same thing. I'm very excited about that because some of these names. Uh, Omar, uh, another, thank you very much, Dr. Hirji. Uh, Omar, another recently approved vaccine is a plant-based and homegrown Covivex. I think I said that right. Um, <laughs> it's by Medigaco. Um, it's tied to the tobacco industry. Do you think that devalues it in any way? From a scientific point of view, the vaccine does look like it works and it is safe and effective. And again, speaking from the engineering logistics point of view, things like the Novavax vaccine and the Medicago vaccine are important tools that we need for better global distribution. Both of these vaccines don't need to be frozen to be stored and they can be they can help really help with distribution, especially in places in the world that just don't have that cold chain of storage. And this is an important step in getting more people vaccinated because the more people are vaccinated, the faster they clear infections, the less viral replication events we have, and we can really help slow down viral mutations. And that keeps our vaccines current longer. Now, the challenge with this tie to the tobacco industry is that is, is partly because of the World Health Organization. So not every country in the world is as fortunate as Canada. We have the resources and we can fund something like Health Canada. Health Canada can look at a uh, producer's documents and they can look at all the clinical data and make the call saying that we've reviewed this data, this vaccine's safe to use on our citizens. Because not every country has this, you know, this level of resources to do that, they rely on the World Health Organization endorsing something. And if the World Health Organization can't do that, then that may lead to some barriers for that uptake. And the WHO can't really you know, endorse something that's tied to the tobacco industry because they have a stance against that because it can cause cancer and hurt people and they don't want to be tied to that. So this is the tricky part. So from just purely scientific point of view, it's a great tool. It'll help with global distribution. It'll help give people protection. It'll help slow down viral evolution. Great. But there's that really important other component of how do we address this tie? And whether that'll be a one-off exception or something else, I'm not sure. But really, other countries do look to the World Health Organization for the cue on whether or not this is okay to use. And Don, I saw you nodding as well. Yeah, I think as Canadians, we have not been very responsible in recognizing global challenges with vaccine distribution. And the Omicron variant was a painful reminder that nobody's safe until everybody's safe. 
And so I think it behooves us to think about things like novel technologies that are amenable to production in, in the global south. Uh, the cold chain issue is one that has been on the vaccine manufacturers' minds for decades. And so I think moving forward, one of my big uh, learnings was that we have to have a more global perspective to vaccine development, including sharing the technologies and also helping train people. It is not a matter of just creating a vaccine and opening a factory. The amount of learning and training uh, and expertise that's required to do these sorts of things needs to be something that we're exporting to the rest of the world. And I really hope this will be a turning point in our commitment to global distribution of these vaccines. And Matthew, Don mentioned earlier that your team uh, is developing uh, a vaccine that can be inhaled. Can you explain to us how that would work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, having, having come from uh, a long background in the influenza field, we recognized very early on that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is a virus that was going to continue to evolve and mutate, which would challenge the effectiveness of our current vaccines. This motiv motivated us to take a different approach and to try and generate a vaccine that would be less susceptible to having its effectiveness decrease in light of viral mutations or the emergence of variants. Uh, in order to do that, we designed a vaccine that contains multiple components of the virus. All current generation vaccines um, are, are targeted against the spike protein only. And that's a challenge because that's a part of the virus that mutates very rapidly um, in the context of variants. By including more viral targets and focusing especially on viral targets that are unable to mutate as much, uh, we've been able to design a vaccine that's in preclinical studies been completely protective against variants. Another important difference of our vaccine is that instead of being injected, it's inhaled. So our propensity to inject vaccines really harkens back to the days of sort of Edward Jenner and the development of smallpox vaccines, where we use this process called scarification, which is which was essentially sort of scratching um, old smallpox material into the arm in order to generate immunity. And that makes a lot of sense for pathogens that cause infections in our blood, for example, because injected vaccines create great immunity throughout our whole bodies. What they don't do so well, though, is create strong immunity in our lungs and resp respiratory tract, which is, of course, where, where viruses like SARS-CoV-2 and influenza infect us. So to overcome that challenge, our vaccine was designed so that it could be delivered via inhalation. And as the vaccine is inhaled, it creates a very different kind of immune system in our lungs that's much more protective, while at the same time still generating that systemic immunity that spreads throughout our whole body. So the combination of targeting the virus in a different way so that we're not constantly chasing its evolution and refocusing the immune response to our respiratory tract, which is, of course, where we're infected, um, is, is sort of the strategy we've taken to get out in front of the virus so that we're not constantly having to update our vaccines perpetually going forward. And just to follow up, uh, that vaccine, you actually inhale it by mouth. We have vaccines where you can uh, intranasal uh, through your nose. Um, yes. Are inhaled vaccines better options than intranasal vaccines as boosters? I think they are. So intranasal vaccines uh, have been approved in the past. Uh, most people are probably familiar with the uh, intranasal influenza vaccine, which is called Flumist. The challenge with intranasal delivery is that that spray remains localized mostly in the upper respiratory tract, primarily the nose and throat. The benefit of inhalation through the mouth is that the vaccine is delivered deep into the lungs. And we know that in the context of COVID-19 and 
uh, influenza for that matter. Infections in the lower lungs is what makes us severely ill. Upper respiratory tract infections tend to be more mild. And so by inhaling the vaccine, we're able to stimulate that protective immunity in not only the upper respiratory tract, but also the lower respiratory tract, um, which we anticipate will provide much stronger protection against severe outcomes. That makes sense. Kind of like an inhaler when you have asthma, right? Um, but Omar, exactly like yeah. that. Okay, Omar, uh, you wanted to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a great opportunity because we're looking at different forms of antibodies, antibodies that are in the blood and antibodies that are in the mucosal area. So, and this is also a great opportunity to remind folks that there are other forms and other parts of your immune system that are actively working all the time. And I think also in addition to this wonderful uh, opportunity we have here, we should also be thinking about cellular immunity. These are special cells in, of your immune system that actually remove cells in your body that are infected. And I think cellular immunity plays a big role in clearing infections in general. So even with and the help of antibodies, this completely different arm of the immune system can really make a big difference. So as we move ahead with new vaccine technologies, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for us to then start leveraging all these other components of the immune system because they are always in play no matter what. And if we can help harness that power a bit more, then we can not only take advantage of you know, inhalable vaccines and injectable vaccines, but there's so many more opportunities to give people really long-term durable and robust immune responses. And we can't underestimate how many people don't like needles, um, especially like with kids and stuff. Uh, Dawn? I was just gonna comment on that. For a number of the vaccine hesitant, mm -hmm. Uh, the fact of being injected is something that really threatens bodily autonomy and they feel much more warmly about things that we inhale. Many people inhale many different things and, uh, and, and feel much more comfortable with that. So I think this is also a way of addressing hesitancy and the needle phobia is not to be laughed at. I mean, certainly uh, parents who don't have flu mist available to them as an intranasal delivery will choose not to vaccinate a, a, a needle hesitant child. So these different technologies help deal with the psychosocial aspect vaccination and may be more palatable to people who have uh, or, or feel uncomfortable with the injection model of a vaccine delivery. Dr. Hirji? Yeah, and I just wanted to basically reinforce what Don's saying, but saying that this is actually an issue with adults as well. I, I don't remember what the numbers are from the surveys that have been done, but it's a pretty significantly large double digit percent of people who have at least some you know, hesitation about getting vaccines and getting injections. And while it may not ultimately stop people from getting vaccinated, often maybe it delays them, it causes them not to get it as early as possible. And for some people, maybe they don't get it at all. And so it's not just an issue for kids. I think it's really an issue for all people. And other means of delivery of vaccines that are more palatable for people can only help. And Dr. Kirji, and to follow up with you, um, do you believe these new vaccine options will really make a difference when it comes to booster uptake? You know, I hope they will. I think the impact is probably going to be fairly small. I look at, you know, in Canada, where in Ontario, even we have close to 90% of people got that injected two doses of vaccines. You know, people are ultimately willing probably to get it. And there's probably only a relatively smaller group who is going to be swayed by some of these new technologies or even some of the newer vaccines we talked about earlier. I think it's going to be particularly helpful, though, down the road if there's, you know, say an additional dose of this vaccine we need to get or perhaps, a, you know, a new pathogen comes on the scene and we develop a vaccine at that point to have these tools available so that we can have a vaccine that hopefully gets much quicker uptake at that point. Matthew? We spoke a little bit earlier about um, some of the challenges now with, with upping the proportion of the population that has received that third booster dose. And I think that um, some of the data we're seeing at this point suggests that the perception that current generation vaccines are not doing as good a job at preventing illness overall, despite the fact that they, they are holding up extremely well against preventing severe disease, is one of the things that's made um, people who haven't received that third dose complacent. And so as we move forward, I think any updates that um, enhance the confidence of individuals that the vaccines are working even better, as well as 
vaccine technologies that prevent the need for regular boosters will be really beneficial because um, as we see in, in flu seasons historically, just the sort of inconvenience factor of, of having to be reboosted annually is a major challenge for rates of vaccine uptake. Many people are not vaccine hesitant or vaccine unwilling. They, they just have a hard time finding the time you know, to go to a pharmacy or doctor's office to, to get that shot. So anything we can do to make the vaccines more effective, I think will be beneficial in, in increasing confidence and therefore acceptability. And of course, the less we have to vaccinate, the more convenient it becomes for people. And by virtue of that, the more um, compliance I, th I think we'll see. Well, Omar, how long into the future do you think we'll need to get boosters? I think it, this is really tied to the global health problem. We can deal with the situation very locally like we did in Canada and see great reductions in the number of cases and hospitalizations. And then we'll get pulled back into the cycle because elsewhere in the world, there was too many replication events and we see a new variant. And this is part of the challenge. So whatever new technology we're coming up with, the most important thing we can do is distribute it because that's the only way we can preserve its efficacy. And if we really want to break out of this cycle, we can't address it locally. We have to address it globally. And, and fortunately, we, we do know that other manufacturers like Pfizer and Moderna, they are working on a more Omicron-specific vaccine. Those are in trials. And perhaps in a few months, we'll see some more of that data. And if that does come out and it's effective against BA2, perfect. But we really need to get that distributed around the world to make an impact and finally break us all out of this cycle because I think part of this is fatigue. The fatigue of having to keep getting vaccinated, but then also the fatigue of how frequently do you need an update? And that's really anything to extend time between doses is phenomenal. Dr. Hirji? Yeah, you know, I just really want to emphasize what Omar was saying and actually I think Don alluded to it earlier. You know, Omar started off our conversation by highlighting that every time of you know in COVID infects someone, that's a replication event. It's an opportunity for that virus to mutate. And when the virus is spreading a lot, it is mutating a lot, and we end up with new variants. And until we really have high vaccine uptake around the world, we are going to probably see new variants emerge that are come back and threaten us and possibly need us to do new vaccines for people, additional doses of vaccines, and which hits on all of those conscience issues that's been highlighted. You know, in Canada, I mentioned we have two doses of vaccines, close to 90%. Globally, it's more about 56% was the last data I saw. And parts of the world are actually in the low double digits in terms of that. So there's a lot of work that I think we can do that is actually going to mean that we are protected long-term and then the process save a lot of lives around the world. Matthew? Yeah, and I just want to expand on on those really insightful comments with with what I hope is is actually a hopeful message for viewers, which is that in comparison to influenza virus, the intrinsic rate that SARS-CoV-2 evolves at is much much slower. The reason that we've seen such massive rapid evolution of variants is indeed because of the huge numbers of global cases that we've seen. So when we can get global cases under control and those resemble something, for example, that we're more used to with influenza, the expectation is that the rate of evolution that we see with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 should actually be much slower. And that in and of itself could reduce the rate at which we need boosters. Um, and so, so I think it, it is so important that we get this situation under control globally because it will, it will considerably change the trajectory and rate at which we experience waves caused by new variants in the future. Um, you know, Don, we, uh, throughout the pandemic, we were joking about how trying to book a, a, a vaccine was kind of like the Hunger Games. May the odds ever be in your favor. Um, and this time around with boosters, I think we're obviously trying to do things differently. Um, how can we best serve older adults and vulnerable people in our vaccine rollout moving forward? 
Absolutely. I think so many of us who have older parents were online trying to get them vaccinated and sorted because a lot of the online systems that we were using were not really accessible. So one of the fundamental uh, teachings of public health is you bring the, the public health measure to the people. You don't ask them to come to you. And I know certainly I've been uh, very heavily involved in the long-term care sector and getting the staff vaccinated was really, really challenging when we were asking them to take time off work and to, to go to a distance. So we need to really make sure that our vaccine strategies bring the measures to the people and also that we're speaking to the specific concerns of specific populations. The concerns of older adults tend to be quite uh, amenable to getting vaccinated if you can get them into the system, but there are racialized communities. A significant number of our unvaccinated right now are people who are new to the country, don't have good access to service. And again, we have to think globally and act lo locally. Any vulnerability is a vulnerability to us all. We need to make sure that we're, we're bringing these measures to local homeless shelters, to people who will not have access or will not feel comfortable or don't have a family doctor. So, you know, bringing the, the vaccines to the people is important and building the trust. And in these low times that we have, when we have a little bit more time and we're not frantically vaccinating, we need to work on education, uh, community building, building up leaders in those communities to be confident about what the vaccine can and cannot do so they can speak in a way that really resonates with their community. Trust for these populations is absolutely enormous. Um, you know, there is a perception that COVID is over. Uh, mask mandates are done. Uh, vaccine passports have been removed. People are traveling. Businesses and events are back to so-called normal. Offices are reopening. Um, do you worry that new vaccines might impact the desire or the need for people to get vaccinated because there's a feeling that this is no longer necessary or urgent? Dr. Harichi, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely a huge concern. And, you know, when I look at some of the data right now in Ontario, we're seeing a very sharp increase in our um, uh, wastewater data. In Niagara here, we've actually seen a doubling of patients who are being treated for COVID-19 in our hospital system over just the past seven days, admittedly starting from a relatively low number, but nonetheless, it's a pretty significant increase. We've seen a doubling of the number of outbreaks we have in long-term care homes and retirement homes in the last week. Um, of course, that's an indication that probably more people are out and about unfortunately getting COVID-19 and then showing up to work or visiting a relative in a long-term care home. So I do think COVID-19 is actually on the rise again. And I think unfortunately, we're not necessarily hearing that strong message from our governments anymore about the importance of continuing to maintain vigilance against COVID-19. I think they framed it that we're at a stage where we no longer want to have, you know, mandated restrictions and it's going to be now more voluntary on us, but they haven't necessarily followed that up with the strong, intense messaging that we need to continue practicing those voluntary measures. And I think in that silence, the signal unfortunately people are getting is measures are going away. So probably there's no longer much risk here. I don't need to worry about going out and getting that third dose. And unfortunately, I think people are going to be complacent, which is going to make us more vulnerable going forward. And I particularly worry about older people, people who are in those marginalized communities that Don was talking about, who, despite even maybe having their vaccines, are still vulnerable for getting severely ill. And I think it's important for the rest of us to still be practicing precautions, getting our vaccines so we can make sure we're not passing infection onto them and putting them in harm. And Omar? Yeah, I think we also have to remember that a part of our population is still completely unvaccinated. So we have the children under six. There are adorable little engines of viral evolution. So we are in having, we are seeing data from places like Moderna that says their vaccines so far look effective and safe for children under six. And as long as those get approved and continue to look safe, then that's going to be an important opportunity for us to get more equity into this because now we'll have most of our population age groups protected. And again, the goal is to bring down the number of viral replication events. So that should be coming up, but that has to be kind of weighed in as well, because we do have this big, you know, part of our population that just have no opportunity to be vaccinated, even if they wanted to. Uh, um, Don, I'm going to give you the last qu the last minute that we have. Um, what would you say to someone who might be thinking it's best to wait for the next va uh, next best vaccine uh, instead of getting the options that we have right now? Even if you don't feel that you're at risk of hospitalization and dying because you've had your two doses, 
Don't forget that having COVID is associated with a lot of long-term health issues. People who've had COVID can be have long COVID, which is a long-lasting syndrome of many, many symptoms that can uh, reduce a, a person's ability to work or to, or to enjoy the activities of daily life. And vaccination protects against that. That three doses will make your Omicron infection shorter, less likely to be symptomatic, and protect you from that long-term health consequences. Your family needs you, your workplace needs you, your community needs you to be as healthy as you can be. And three doses will help you get there. Thank you so much for taking some time to speak to us on this really fascinating topic uh, and giving your insights. We really do appreciate all the work that you're doing for our communities. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.